Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. What you see on the bench here is an IBM PC 5150, and what you see right here is a motherboard from one of these machines. Now, this motherboard was one I featured on the second channel video recently, where I had several motherboards I took a look at, and this one was not working, not working at all. I did some rudimentary troubleshooting in that video, which I'll link to, of course, down in the description below, but I never got it working. So in this video, we're gonna take a deep dive look at this motherboard to try to figure out exactly what's wrong with it. I do wanna add one thing though, that unlike the Commodore 64, I'm not super familiar with the circuit design of the original IBM PC motherboard. So there's gonna be quite a bit of figuring out and learning on my part as we go through this video. So strap on your oscilloscopes and let's get right to it. All right, so the PC motherboard. Let's try to dig into this and see if I can get it working. First things first though, I need to test out my capture setup just to make sure that I don't have a black screen on the capture setup that is leading me down the wrong path with this motherboard. So on the bench, we have my 46 test bed motherboard here. Let's just get this thing hooked up. We're gonna use a CGA card because ultimately for the original IBM PC, even though you can use a VGA card, definitely recommended to do troubleshooting with a CGA card because it's uh, well, pretty much what that thing was designed for, along with the monochrome card. So with the card in the 46 motherboard, I have it hooked up right here to the RGB to HDMI, which is how we're gonna be capturing this video. And let's give this thing a power up. I saw a flash and there it is. I just wanted to make sure without a doubt that the capture setup is working and that looks absolutely perfect with this CGA card here. So we're good to go. If you're curious about the CGA card that I'm using here, this is a VTech card, so it's out of the VTech line of computers. And yes, recently I've had a lot of conversations on the channel about VTech. What I like about this card is it offers 100% full CGA compatibility, but also it doesn't offer any of the snow that you get on CGA cards. So any software package that accesses the card's video memory directly doesn't result in any snow, which means in DOS, if you do DIR and they're scrolling with the BIOS routines, you don't get that flashing, which you get with the original IBM CGA cards. There's another version of this card that I actually do have, and it has the composite video jacks right here. And it has two because one is monochrome and one has color output. So one of them always has the color burst disabled, which can be useful if you're trying to use it with a TV set. In addition, there's a toggle switch right here that actually switches between MDA and CGA. So this is a dual purpose card that can do both. So that's really one of the reasons why I keep this particular card around for testing because of that dual purpose functionality and it's just a good fully compatible CGA card. Okay, so the PC5150 motherboard. If you haven't seen the first video where I first showed off this motherboard, just a recapper, it's a 256K motherboard, so 64 to 256K. That means that it uses normal 44 or 4164 chips. It doesn't use 4116 like the very earliest version of this board. That means all the DRAM that's on here is five volts only. You don't have to worry about the 12 volt and minus five volt rail, like on the 4116 chips. This motherboard, when I got it, was really dirty. So I gave it a good scrubbing with soap and water, dried it off, and well, now it looks perfect. In case you aren't totally familiar with the original 5150 motherboard, it only has five ISA expansion slots, unlike eight on the later XT. And it also has two keyboard jacks here, what looked like keyboard jacks, and that's because one of them is actually for a cassette drive. One of the jacks takes the keyboard, this one here closest to the edge, the other one the cassette drive, which in basic, which is built into the ROM BIOS on this, lets you allows you to save and load programs without having a disk drive. As far as I'm aware, IBM did sell no disk drive versions of the original 5150, probably the very cheapest bare bone machine. So all you could do is use the cassette drive to save and load programs if anyone did use this at all. In fact, I'm really curious if you had an original 5150 back in the day without any disk drives, did you use the cassette drive on there to save and load programs? Was there anyone who actually did that or pretty much everyone splurged for at least one floppy drive so you could boot into DOS or something like that? And I was plugging the power to this motherboard. I really didn't do much troubleshooting on this thing. Uh, in the first video when I worked on it, I just sort of tried to make sure that everything looked like it was set properly on the dip switches here. 
that the CPU was good. And I think this clock generator I see right here was missing. So I repopulated that from a spare I had, but the motherboard didn't appear to do anything. So maybe it's miraculously fixed itself and there won't be much of a video here, but let's just see what happens. There we go. The motherboard is powered up right now. I know we don't have any lights or anything on here, but the power supply underneath here, the fan is on, so it hasn't shorted out. And we're getting absolutely nothing on the CGA cart here, just like it was doing before. Now, if you have a 5150 that doesn't appear to be working and the system does power up like this, the very first thing you need to do is double check the dip switch settings here. Minus zero degrees.net has a really good guide on how to do that. So just Google for minus zero degrees and 5150 switches and it'll take you right to this page. So there are two switch blocks on the motherboard, as you can see right here. Switch one is the block closest to the center of the motherboard. That's this one right here. And that describes these switches right here. All right, first switch, no floppy drives. So switch one should be on, which it is. Switch two should be on for no math coprocessor, which is right here, there's an empty socket. Installed RAM on the motherboard. So we have two switches here. It's currently set to off and off, which is banks 0123 populated. That is correct. That's actually what matches this particular motherboard. It says here in the 5150, these switches do not enable and disable the RAM. See note one below. And important, if you have the 102782 dated motherboard BIOS, see note two below. Note one, IBM 5150, all the banks are permanently enabled. Switches three and four only inform the BIOS of the population. However, see note two below. And note two says there are software bugs in this version of the BIOS. So all four banks must be populated and the switch is set appropriately. It says here on the extra information page that if you have that buggy BIOS and you don't have all four banks, then the system will still turn on. You just have it reporting erroneously the amount of memory you have. I just wanted to make sure this is not a problem that just kept the system from working at all. All right, back to the switch settings. So the next one that is probably gonna be causing us a problem right now is switch five and six here. Currently it's set to on and on. So card has a BIOS, so like a VGA or EGA card, because that's what I was testing with last time I tried this motherboard. We want to have this set for five on and six off, which is CGA at 80 columns. So there we go. And then switches seven and eight are entirely due to the number of floppy drives. And yes, this machine does support up to four floppy drives, so two internal and two external. But I think this doesn't really matter how you set these if you have the original switch, this one right here set to on, which is no floppy drives. All right, the next switch block, which is this one right here, this sets the total amount of conventional memory that this particular motherboard has. Now remember, the motherboard itself can take 256K of RAM, but you can add an ISA card that has additional memory on it and bring this system all the way up to, well, I think this particular one with a 256K on the motherboard can go all the way to 640K. Here we go. This system currently should have 256K, so we should have 10011. That's on, off, off, on, on. And looking at the motherboard here, we have on, off, off, on, on, and the other ones don't matter, so I currently have them all set to off. That means that the switches were all set perfectly, except for the fact I had it set for VGA and not CGA, so that can actually cause a no display situation because of the mismatched video setting on this switch here. So I just turned the system back on, and we still have absolutely nothing happening, and that's with the switch set correctly now. All right, so down to some troubleshooting. First thing we wanna do is we're gonna take a look at some of the signals on the CPU here. To help facilitate that, I'm gonna use this little clip thing here, which I can just clip right onto the CPU. Uh, you don't need to have one of these. It just means it's a little bit easier to use my oscilloscope probe on the CPU without having to kind of get behind uh, on these pins back here, which aren't so easy when I have the camera pointing down at the bench sort of blocking my vision. Okay, so for checking the signals on the 8088, very first thing we're gonna need to do is bring up the uh, pin out of it here. And let's start poking around. All right, first off, I'm on pin 40 right here, which is VCC. Turning that on right here, you can see that we're at 5.1 volts or so. So we're looking good there. If you watch my videos regularly on troubleshooting, you'll know there's a few things that you need to check while troubleshooting one of these machines or any machine for that matter. If it doesn't show signs of life, what are the first things you need to do? Check voltage. Well, we did, we're getting five volts. You also need to check that there's a clock that's valid and you need to check that there is a reset signal that is valid. Here's the clock right here on pin 19. So that's that pin. And if we turn on the computer and zooming in right there, 4.77 megahertz. So that definitely means we're getting a good clock. Now I am curious, this clock, what I think is a clock generator right here on the motherboard, if we pop that out, 
I think the clock is going to go away. All right, with that IC out, we turn this on. Yep, sure enough, we have absolutely no clock signal. So without this little IC in there, we weren't going to get any kind of working system. All right, it's back in the motherboard. Let's just make sure. There it is, 4.77 megahertz. Move that out of the way. So we're looking good. That clock signal is nice and stable. This little IC right here, this is made by AMD. It's an 8284. And you'll find this on any of the original PCXT or original PC motherboards. Even the clone ones are going to have this chip. It might have two of them, in fact, if it has a turbo mode. Often they did that by adding a second one. Uh, but yeah, you'll find it somewhere on the motherboard. It's not always in this position, but it has that same part number. All right, voltage is good. Clock is good. Let's do reset, which is pin 21 right at the bottom here. When I turn this on, um, I'm going to have to look at the data sheet, but it should start out low and then go high. Let's see what happens. Okay, it, it goes from high to low. Uh, let's double check that that is the way this works. I think it will be actually. Notice how test right here has a line on the top of it or the read write pin here has a line on the top of it. That means that those are active low. Now on the 6502, the reset line is active low, which means that when that signal goes down to ground, it puts the processor in reset. So when you first turn on a computer, like on a Commodore 64, and you look at the reset line, it starts out around ground. And then after a few hundred milliseconds or whatever like that, it jumps back up to five volts and the processor starts executing. Because there's no line over here, this means it is active high. The computer, when you turn it on, the signal should be high and then it should go low to disable the reset and start execution of the CPU. And we do that and that's exactly what we see. It starts high and then it goes low, which means the processor should be out of reset right now and executing code. So let's take a look at the address and the data lines now. Now you notice on the 8088, it says AD0, 1, 2, 3 through 7. Those are the address and the data bus lines, 0 through 7. They are multiplexed which means the processor uses every other cycle to either send data on the data bus or receive data on the data bus or send address line signals to all the other peripherals through those lines. Now, the rest of these address lines up here are not multiplex, which means they're single function. Well, these ones are over here. These are multiplex as well, S3, S4, S5, and S6. But these ones up here are not, which is why it just says A12, for instance. So on the CPU here, I am now on pin 16 which means when I turn this on, if the processor is running code or trying to run code, we should see plenty of activity here on address line zero. And we're not. It's just sitting there kind of doing nothing. Let's check out the next line here. Same thing. Let's go up to these address lines at the top. That's just high. So this processor, even though it's not in reset right now, so there's reset, it's definitely not running anything. All right, let's look at the data sheet some more because I'm actually not super familiar with troubleshooting uh, PCs like this. So I don't actually know what you have to do to start the 8088 executing code. Now look at this. So for the address buses, uh, zero through seven this is what we're looking at. It floats to three state off during interrupt acknowledge and local bus hold acknowledge. Looking back up here, there's this hold pin and hold acknowledge 31. I think maybe this is a way for the CPU to be disabled by the motherboard. So let's take a look at what the hold signal does. Maybe that's somehow being held at a state that's disabling the processor, and that's why this thing is just doing nothing. Pin 31 is hold, that's an input, and 30 is an output, and that's hold acknowledge. Hold indicates that another master is requesting local bus hold to be acknowledged. Hold must be active high, Processor receiving the hold request will issue the HLDA or hold acknowledge high as an acknowledgement in the middle of T4 or TI clock cycle. Simultaneous with the issuance of the hold acknowledge, the processor will float the local bus and control lines after hold is deselected as being low. So if we see hold as high, remember it's active high. So if the hold is low, that means the processor is not being told to basically go into a hold state. Now, before I finish reading this, the one of the reasons why this line is very useful on the 8088 is because if something else on the system wants to be a bus master or do DMA or direct memory access, then basically it needs to disable the processor as that other IC needs to take control of the address bus and access the memory. This is something that the 6502, the regular 6502 does not have built in. So to facilitate DMA on a 6502, uh, by disabling the address bus, you need to have extra logic. Now the Apple II does that, for instance, extra chips on there, and I'm sure other systems like the BBC Micro does as well. But the 8088 has this built in, 
and this hold line is directed or controlled by another peripheral on the motherboard to disable the processor while a bus mastering or DMA access is happening. Scope probe is on pin 31, the hold signal, the input signal to the processor. If this signal, when I turn this on, which the computer's currently off, if I turn it on and it is high, that means that something on the motherboard is telling the processor to uh, disable itself. And there it is, it's high. So absolutely, something on the motherboard is telling the computer, hey, disconnect your data bus. And if I move this over to the output pin, which is pin 30, hold acknowledge, it's also high. And if you remember from this uh, data sheet here, hold is active high and a processor that's being held will turn on the hold acknowledge signal, which is also high. And that is exactly what we're seeing. So that is why this computer is not executing any code right now. If I put in a diagnostic ROM on here or work on the RAM or whatever, that doesn't matter. Nothing is actually gonna happen on this computer until we solve the issue with that hold signal being high all the time. Now we're very lucky that there are schematics for this particular motherboard. So all we need to do is let's reference that. We have the 64 to 2TSK version. So let's take a look at the document here from the technical reference from IBM. All right, well, here we are in the schematics. And I guess I'm misunderstanding this because there's pin 31 right there. It's actually tied to five volts directly. So it's kind of expected that that's gonna be high. And that was right here, pin 31. But it also has this RQGTO right here. And that's what's labeled right here, RQGTO. And down here, pin 30, which I thought was the uh, hold acknowledge, was RQGTI. So back to the data sheet, let me try to figure out what these other signals are then. All right, here it is, RQGTO. So these are alternative functions, I guess, for these. Quest grants. These are used by other local bus masters to force the process to release the local bus. Okay, so it has the same function. Each pin is bi-directional, so they're I slash O, all right? With RQGTO having higher priority than RQGT1. RQGT has an internal pull-up resistor, so it may be left unconnected. I think the key part I was missing was right here. The following pin functions are descriptions for the ADA in minimum mode. Only the pin functions which are unique to minimum mode are described. Okay, and down here, it says it's in maximum mode. So that means the MM, the MN slash MX is at ground. So there are two modes of operation. So obviously the 5150, probably the every other PC clone, runs this chip in maximum mode which offers more capability. If we look at the MNMX pin, which here it is, pin 33, when MX for maximum is low, that means that the chip is going to be in maximum mode. And I am on that pin right here, and we turn on the system, and obviously it's at ground. I'm sure if we look at the schematics, that's just tied to ground on the motherboard that just keeps this processor in that mode all the time. All right, so back to these pins. That means that pin 31 obviously is going to be at 5 volts all the time, because that's what we see on the schematics. But that means that pin 30 does go off somewhere else on the motherboard. But notice here it's pulled up to 5 volts through a 4.7K. So hooked up to pin 30, when we turn this on, it just goes high right away. At one time I turned it off and on, and I saw it sort of float in the middle and then went high, but it's high right away. So, okay, let's change the trigger mode to falling. What I wanna do is I'm gonna turn this thing off and on and we wanna see if we see this thing. Actually, let's just clear this away. There we go. Let's see if we see it being pulled low even briefly. No, nothing is pulling it low uh, whatsoever. Well, let me just start looking at all of the various signals on the chip and try to figure out which one of them might indicate why the processor is not running. All right, so all the address lines that I looked at so far are floating. Now there are these ones here, which are multiplex. Um, this is address line 16, 17, 18, and 19. And it's multiplexed with these extra signals here, which allow for some signaling to come out of the processor. But I bet you these lines are also tri-stated. And then we're on 37, which I assume is address line 17, S4. It's currently at four volts, so it's currently high. And then S3, which was this one, was low. So code or none. <laughs> what does that mean? Let's turn the processor off and on, or turn the computer off and on. Oh, there was a little activity there. Did you see that? A little something, a little something something. Not that time though. So we were seeing one and zero, code or none. The information indicates which segment register is presently being used for data accessing. Okay, well, I don't quite know what that means. Let's just move on. 
Okay, pin 32, RD. Read strobe indicates the processor is performing a memory or IO read cycle. Now I'm on pin 32 here, and it is just low. So let's turn this off and on. So look at that, we do have a little, a little spike of some type of activity there. It almost meant that it tried to do a read. So since this has a line over it, that means it's active low, which means the processor is currently trying to read memory. Next up is a ready signal. Ready is an acknowledgement from the address memory IO device that it will complete the data transfer. The ready signal from the memory or IO is synchronized to the 8084 clock generator to form ready. The signal is active high and the 8088 ready input is not synchronized. Correct operation is not guaranteed if the setup and hold times are not met. All right, and I'm on the ready pin and it is currently low. So when I turned off the computer, there was a spike there just for a split second, but now it's gone away. So this is low all the time. I wonder what that's supposed to look like while the system is operating. So this is this is coming in from uh, the 8084 chip right here and it's low all the time. Does that indicate a problem? Next up, we're on pin 18 interrupt request, which is a high active high signal and it's just currently sitting there uh, at low. So that's fine, I guess. There's a test signal, which is currently high. Here's the test signal and it's pulled up to five volts by 4.7K resistor. And it's also tied to this busy line. And this is the uh, math coprocessor socket. Pin 17 is non-maskable interrupt. It is active high. It's currently just low. Power cycling the computer doesn't change. Down here in the maximum section, S2, 1, and 0, these are outputs. And it looks like it has various modes that the processor can be in. So let's take a look at what these are. This is pins 26, 27, and 28. All right, we're on S2, which is currently low. S1 is currently low. And finally, S0 is high. So we have 001, read IO port. Read IO port? Power cycle the computer, let's just double check. It's currently in that mode, and it is. I guess at least it's not in a halted state or something like that. So one thing that's interesting here is if the processor is currently trying to read from the data bus, then that makes sense that address lines zero through seven are tri-state because it's looking for something to actually return some type of data, either zeros or one, back into the processor on those lines. But what's perplexing to me is that the processor is just stuck in this state here where it's waiting for a read. And is there some type of signal that comes back to the processor to say, hey, okay, read from the data bus. Like I'm, the processor just waits until whatever on the data bus is put there and then something tells it to you know, continue executing code. Which of the signals is on here that tells the processor to continue executing code and to read from the data bus and then go on to do the next thing? Is it the ready signal here? Ready is the acknowledgement from the address memory or IO device that it will complete the data transfer. Seems like that might be the one right there. So the processor might just sit there and wait, because this is an input here, until this signal is sent to the chip and the chip will then sample the data bus and then continue and move on from there. So back on the schematics, let's take a look at this ready signal and let's see where this goes. Well, it goes through this block right here and it does end up right here at the 8284. So that's that clock generator chip that I know I've changed out on this board. It's this one right here. Now, see this shaded area that it goes into? That actually is like a bus of signals that goes elsewhere on the machine. And if we scroll down, it's right here going to the other processor uh, that's not installed, the math coprocessor. And that's it. It doesn't really go anywhere else. So the only thing that's generating that ready signal is the 8284. Here's the data sheet for the 8284. And there is the output of ready, and it's sort of made up of a bunch of other signals. So that's a little complicated, unfortunately. That means there's, there's all sorts of things that could be affecting this. So that's the clock input from reset. Well, we know reset works. I'm assuming this generates the reset, um, which we see is working well. So it's this stuff right here, async, a enable, a enable one, ready, these various signals here, which go into the chip which could be problematic on this motherboard. I'm assuming, I'm assuming this is the problem here. I don't know for sure, to be honest. Now back on the schematics for the 5150, we have those various signals here that come into it. So there's like ready one, DMA wait, interesting. Ready two is grounded, address enable, ready wait. 
In fact, these are the only two real relevant signals because ready two is tied to ground, um, address enable two is tied to five volts. So it's ready weight here and DMA weight. These two signals are what go into this chip and control that ready signal that comes out of it. So let's go to page two, and see if we can take a look at those DMA chips. All right, so one of the signals right here is DMA weight, and that comes out of this LS175, which you know could well be bad. Um, active low, right? This is an active low signal. So if we look here at this chip right here, DMA weight, active low, pin four. I'm currently on pin four, and that is active low. It is just sitting there. It does start high and then go low. So DMA weight. Hmm. My assumption here is that that should be pulsing maybe. Now the DMA on the 5150 is, is used to refresh the memory, the DRAM. So it's not like the DMA is never used. It is sometimes, but um, I don't think it should be active all the time right here. And if we go to ready weight pin three, which is currently low as well, and that is active low. And let's find that ready weight. There it is, ready weight comes out of that chip there. If we turn the computer off and turn it back on, it does have high and then go low. So one of my biggest problems here is I don't really understand the architecture of the PC. I mean, I've been using PCs forever, but I've never really delved down at the block diagrams to see how all of these ICs interact with each other. Now, here's the clock generator chip, which generates the ready, the clock, and the reset. I don't know why it says preset signal, but I'm assuming that's reset. Uh, that goes to the main processor and it says power. But if we go down here, this comes to the wait state logic, which is doing, I'm not 100% sure to be honest. Uh, we do see the interrupt controller here. We have a bus controller, data buffers, auxiliary processor, non-maskable interrupt logic right here. So there's the DMA controller. Looks like the DMA controller gets signal from this shaded area here, which comes from IOCS decoder, I guess. That's obviously just like a chip select function. And it looks like this shaded area right here, control bus makes its way up to here, control lines, which I think goes into the way state logic. So that's all those logic chips we were looking at that generate those signals that go into the clock generator. Looking at the DMA section here, it talks about how you know, there are four DMA channels and three of them are available for use, but the fourth one is programmed to refresh the system's dynamic memory. So DMA is used to refresh all the DRAM on here. It's not done by some other logic circuit. This is done by programming a DMA channel of the timer counter device to periodically request a dummy DMA transfer. This action creates a memory read cycle, which is available to refresh the dynamic storage, both on the system board and in the expansion slots, all DMA Data transfers except the refresh channel take five microprocessor clocks of 210 nanoseconds. So unfortunately, IBM's technical documentation here doesn't really talk about what the ready signal should be doing and that logic that goes to it. It doesn't really say how the wait state functionality or whatever that DMA stuff actually works. I found this document online though. If ready pin is placed at logic zero, the microprocessor enters into the wait states and remains idle. If ready pin is placed at logic one, it has no effect on the operation of the microprocessor. And just as a reminder, the ready pin is definitely held low all the time on this machine. So absolutely right there, that's the problem why this computer is not executing code. So it took me a while to get there, but now at least we have an idea of where the problem is. The problem is going to be with this logic right here or potentially some of the other inputs into this logic that controls or, or signals the 8482 or 8284 right here. In fact, we saw that this pin right here, pin four, which is ready one, was currently held low all the time, which right here, ready one, bus ready. These signals are indicators from a device located on the system bus that is available or data transfer has been received. Ready one and ready two are qualified by address enable one and address enable two respectively. And pin three is currently low as is pin four. I'm just gonna double check by turning the computer off and on. Yeah, it goes high and low. We can see ready two is tied to ground. So we can assume that ready one being at ground right now as well is probably fine because that's probably just like a normal state um, for this chip to be in. And then enable two is tied to VCC. And we know enable one is currently held down at ground as well. 
which my assumption is if that were at five volts, that would be normal operation of the system. So let's go trace back ready weight to see what chips are involved with that signal. Okay, there's ready weight. And that comes over here from U82. I'm gonna start writing these down here, which is a 74S74. And let's keep following this over. So there's a clock input here, which comes from a whole bunch of things here through U64, 74LS20, which also is coming from these gates right here. But there is another signal here, the D signal, that's coming in right here, this DAC signal here, which I think is DMA Acknowledge. There's also IO channel ready right here, which... Uh, which makes its way here to the PR pin. It's got a pull-up resistor. So let's take a look at this 74LS74 and try to see the truth table on that to try to validate the inputs on this chip. This is like what you kind of got to do. You got to keep going backwards further and further to try to find the source of the problem. So I think the output we're concerned about is the Q output, which is right here, Q, and it's currently low. So there are two situations where the output can be low. So I'm gonna clip onto this chip and just validate that the inputs or at least the truth table here matches because uh, currently this chip is not changing state, which means that we can easily validate um, that these signals here going into it match the output. That sort of validates that this chip is working. I validated the 74LS74 and the signals look good on there. They match the data sheet. The truth table sort of tells all. The condition it's in right now is high, high, low, this one right here, and it's resulting in Q0? I actually don't know what Q0 means. My assumption is that Q0 is like the uninitialized state of this flip-flop, and you need the clock inputs right here to actually go high to then toggle the outputs of this IC. And I'm assuming, yeah, that's what Q0 must mean. Now, I'm currently on the clock input, which is what we're looking at here on the oscilloscope. And if we turn off the computer, turn it off and on, we never get anything on this at all. Nothing comes in here. So my assumption is that this is the problem, that this line's not toggling like it should, and that is causing um, this particular flip-flop to never do its thing, which never turns on the ready signal on this part of the motherboard here. Boy, I should get this under the camera. Oops, so we can uh, see this a little better. Yeah, so this chip is not outputting ready, so the processor's never running, I think because of the clock signal. Now, when we look here at the schematics, there's the clock. It goes through a whole bunch of logic chips. So it goes through this LS20 here, also this um, LS10, and which is connected down here to the output of this 175, which is fed through the CPU clock signal right here. So the CPU clock feeds into the clock of U98, and I'm assuming this D1 output, which is feeding into this, should be doing stuff. So let's take a look at these gates. Um, it's gonna take me a while just to kind of plug this little um, clip onto them and, and check. So I will report back when I find something that looks amiss. We're on the LS175 right here. Clock signal goes in on pin nine. That's this right here, and that's working fine. But this is not getting the correct input signals. So D0 here comes from another chip, which we'll look at in a second. Uh, the reset line, which is hooked up here to the clear input. Uh, if we scroll around here, well, it, it, I, I follow the trace. It is reset. That is working fine. Uh, clock is working fine. Oops, that's, the probe just fell off. Uh, but D0 is not getting anything correct. D1, I think, looks correct, but D0 is not. So the output of this is what goes to... Uh, this gate here, anyways, this all kind of goes into this clock uh, input right here, and that is not getting any pulses, right? Because we know the clock input here on the 74LS74 without the pulses isn't going to work. It's not going to send the right signal to that chip to generate the ready signal for the processor. Um, yeah, and these other things here, I don't think it's these this DMA signal or these XIOR signals. I took a look at all the inputs on here. They're not just doing anything, but my assumption is that this one here that gets the clock should be sending a signal into this U84, and it is not. I think these are operating correctly, but what's not operating 
Well, I think this chip is operating correctly too, but it is not getting the correct input signals, which means I need to follow this trace here over to this IC, this LS74, which is another flip-flop. In fact, is that the same one? It's U67. Uh, no, it's a different one, okay? I also noticed that it's the hold signal here that goes to wherever, something on page four. So it's not the one I thought was going to the processor, it's another one. But that is also generated by this particular flip-flop. It also has a clock signal, which let's look at what this clock is. Looks like it's clock 88, whatever that is. Let's take a look and make sure that that clock signal is working. So there I am on pin three, and we are getting some type of a signal here. Let's zoom in, oops, zoom in on this. What are we getting? 4.77 megahertz, okay. So a correct clock is coming in to this chip. Let's take a look at these other signals. This, this kind of TTL logic stuff is pretty complicated to follow uh, for this reason. Okay, so that just loops around. Uh, this signal here is actually coming from the chip we were just looking at. So that's not gonna do anything. So I think it's the clear signal we need to be concerned about, which seems to come from this gate right here. It's pulled up and then this hold request DMA. Hmm, I wonder if that's coming from the DMA controller and all of this is called, caused by the DMA controller causing shenanigans. Pin one, clear, is high. The PR signal is low, which is this state right here on the top. Clock doesn't matter and the output should be high. And that does match, we're getting high right there. I think the truth table here is completely matching. So the reality is, is that when this clear line is held, like it is being held right here on the output of this gate, that means I think this chip will not do anything. Okay, looking over here at U52, I have the clip on it. Hold request DMA, pin two. It's active low, because it has a line over it, and it is currently low. Hmm, okay, pin one should be just at five volts. Uh, wait, what? It's not? That's supposed to be pulled up. Uh, there's a resistor network here, pulled up to five volts, and it's not. That kind of indicates that this chip might be bad. If this chip is damaged, pin one is holding this uh, pull up low. Just make sure I have good contact on the chip here. Yeah, I'm on there. <laughs> What's going on? Hmm. Let's see if this chip is hot. It is not, it is not warm at all. Let's look at the output on pin three. That is at 3.4 volts. I don't know, this is all looking very weird. I don't think this is, this is working correctly, this chip. And that's going into the clear pin right there. Hmm. I'm suspecting there's something wrong with this IC. So let's pull it out. This will be the first chip I desolder on this board. And let's see if that is our culprit. Alrighty, there is the chip removed from the board. Pretty easy. If you use lots of hot air on the backside, it's easier to desolder. These motherboards have a lot of copper in them. They're just very well made. So it wicks away the heat. So using hot air while you're usually desoldering iron really helps uh, get those pins freed up. First thing we gotta look at is pin one here. So when we turn this on, it is now pulled up <laughs> to five volts as it should. Pin two is also up at five volts. So that is this uh, DMA signal that was uh, down around ground. Now, of course, the output is, I don't know, it's gonna be floating because there is no output um, with this chip here because it's out of the board. So I have another one. Let's pop this one in. There it is. And I have my clip on there. So the chip's in the board. That's five volts, that's pin one. Pin two as, oh, well, that's different. That is different. Pin three is the output and it's inverted, which is what it should do. And already, I'm, well, I mean, I can, this chip right here for sure. Let's just go check out the CPU right now. All right, let's check out pin 22 on the CPU. Oh my God, look at that. So clearly, the right signal is getting through the clock generator now. <laughs> so like, so this motherboard actually can, can execute code now all because of this bad chip. 
All right, that doesn't mean we're out of the water yet. Uh, I think um, might as well plug in the, the CGA card. Who knows, maybe this thing came to life and there's the input for the capture device. And no, we still do not have a working system, <laughs> unfortunately. So we have another bad chip on this motherboard, obviously. Something else is wrong now. So we have some amount of activity, which is a good sign, but we're still not out of the water. Okay, so let's look at these address lines again, the ones that were always floating before. So there we are, let's turn on the system. And okay, so we still have no activity. We still have no activity. Wait, okay, it's actually, they're not floating, but they're not changing either. So the processor is still not running. It's, it's like it's trying to run and then it stops. If we turn the system off and on, yeah, it just, just doesn't go anywhere at all. All right, but again, if we go back to the ready pin right here, we're actually getting some activity. Let's see what how long it takes to appear. It should be blank or nothing until the system comes out of reset. And yes, okay, and you saw there was a little bit of activity there, so that's a good sign. One problem is solved. Alrighty, I think I'm gonna have to take a break here. I've been working on this motherboard for a good number of hours. It took a little while to decode that logic and find that bad chip. So at least we have some progress. The system is closer to trying to work, but obviously it's still not actually running any code because if it were running BIOS code, we'd be seeing activity there on those address lines, the data address lines, and we're not, it's just sort of stuck. So we'll have to wait for part two when I'll dig back into this motherboard and start the whole troubleshooting process again at the processor and try to figure out what next is wrong with this machine because clearly we have more faults. So if you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know what to do. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. They get early access videos and other behind the scenes stuff. And you can become a patron at the link in the description below. If you haven't yet subscribed to my channel and you're watching my videos regularly, I'd really appreciate it if you do hit the subscribe button. I can see metrics and it looks like a lot of people who do watch are not subscribed. And YouTube definitely seems to give more impressions to videos on channels that have more subscribers. It means that the exposure of the videos is just less. But that is gonna be it. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.